Hey, welcome back everyone. We have two more panels in the stage area and then we'll be moving into the sessions area for social hour. I see a lot of great questions coming in on the chat. I apologize, uh, the sessions are really full and short, so we haven't been able to get to them, but we'll get to them during social hour. I'm pleased to introduce you to our next panel moderator, JT Rooney, who will be discussing to real time or not to real time with his panel. Please enjoy. All right, hi everyone. I think we're beginning here. Um, Welcome to this panel. Um, we are doing the to real time or not to real time. Uh, there's a bit of a description online if you've checked it out, but we're basically discussing what real time content rendering and real time, you know, uh, performances and shows and whether it's real time design or real time rendering, all these different things. Um, we have a good group of people here today. We've all been discussing a little bit and uh, we all know each other from various worlds. We have uh, Patrick Wambold here, who's a technical account manager at Epic Games. Uh, he provides support for live events, broadcast clients using Unreal Engine. He comes from the world of live entertainment and is one of us and uh, has lots to share about the new world of Unreal that everyone's hearing about all the time. We have Finn Ross also here, who's a video designer and the co-creative director at Frey Studio in the UK. We've seen his work on lots of uh, theater and installation shows all over the world and has been a huge proponent on the notch and real-time workflow as well as other uh, tools. We have Kirsten Hovland here from Part, who is a partner at Electronic Countermeasures, uh, a post-disciplinary -dis art and design studio. Uh, a lot of you will recognize Kirsten from over the years on a lot of these conferences and events and does really great stuff on all fronts of technology. Um, and I'm JT Rooney. I work as a screen producer at Silent Partners Studio, which is a content studio based in Montreal in LA. And I work primarily in live shows and pop music, but there's a lot of other tech sort of things with real-time content that I've been a part of over the past couple of years. So, hi everyone. I don't know if everyone can hear me okay. Hey. Hi friends. <laughs> um, so we've been chatting a little bit about this, but I think it's a great place to start and talk about, you know, real-time rendering and generative content has been around in a lot of various forms for years and years and years. Um, it's kind of evolved and ebbed and flowed over the years from hard coding to, you know, custom software to more traditional tools now, like video game engines and tools like Notch or Touch Designer, or, you know, what have you that have become way more prevalent. I think we wanted to just chat and like discuss a bit how this works. Uh, from a design perspective. I think there's a lot of conversations about being able to render something in real time and therefore, you know, it just is instant or there's no process behind it. But is there a world where design is getting devalued when we promise real-time content creation? Can we benefit from these tools uh, but still prioritize the creative process? And so I think a question I'd like to start with a bit is what factors drive your decisions whether or not to go real-time solutions versus pre-rendered content? Like think about I would say 2020, but it doesn't count. So think about in 2019, what kind of decisions you made, uh, whether to do something in real time or not. Uh, maybe Finn, you could start and chat about some of your shows. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I feel lucky enough to have at least done one show this year uh, where we did, uh, basically, we did it entirely with real time tools. Uh, not all in the media server, some real-time rendering, some kind of uh, you know blocks hosted in the media server, because uh, you know we we just reached a point with After Effects and kind of pipeline where it was just it was taking too long and kind of good ideas were going by the wayside and also kind of resolutions of like LED services were getting so large actually kind of keeping up with rendering for them was sort of becoming you know taxing so it was it was time to kind of move on I think we felt so. Like, I mean, to kind of borrow the phrase, we decided it was time to break up with After Effects. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of scary, but we just decided on uh, Back to the Future, the musical, uh, that we would, if we could at all do it in Notch, we would do it in Notch, um, which is our sort of chosen tool uh, for that project. And, you know, it was kind of a bit scary because we kind of, at first, we're like, oh, it'll all be a block and the museum will be grey. And of course, it can't be because there's like there's only so much a computer can do. And there's going to be a point where you just want something to look a little bit prettier. And at that point, you do need to render it. So, like, we kind of set out a series of rules uh, for things to give ourselves as, you know, block or render. Uh, and, you know, if it was going to be uh, a block in the server, it was something that had to 
either be endlessly generating or something that was responding to events that were not governed by time code and were kind of more actor driven. So you could have animation seamlessly respond to a human being who is kind of free uh, and not constrained. And then if it was locked within time code, then it would be rendered, but the rendering platform would be notch. And sort of with that, it's sort of how we kind of went forward and began to kind of make the show. And you know, there's a lot of R&D and a lot of kind of frustration and kind of going like, I could do this in three seconds in After Effects. Like, why can't I do this now? You know, but then it, it, it's also about kind of changing your mindset and changing how you think about things. Uh, and then sort of being patient and, you know, don't get, because then other things like trying to keep up with a DeLorean flying around the stage, you know, actually were really easy and much easier than they would have been previously because, you know, that was just a big old 3D world. Um, so it was kind of, it was an interesting experience because it we we definitely achieved more than we could have done if we hadn't gone down that path. But we then also found ourselves killing media servers quite a lot, trying to get there as well, because, you know, that relationship is still sort of finding its grounding. Um, so it was a kind of, I mean, it's definitely opened our eyes for the future and the tools that we'll use, because I think we, we in the studio have made a big shift and we're, we're continuing on that path. Mm-hmm. That's that's an interesting uh, kind of progression path because I I think that that's what drove a lot of us I think to move towards real time engines was we couldn't get what we wanted out of After Effects. So you, I think you're lucky you skipped over Nuke, but like that was my you know I was like I was like oh well Nuke's faster you know and I mean it's really expensive but you know and and you know there was a gain there as well but then at some point it was like this still isn't what we want you know we really want to be able to get like you know at least bare minimum preview quality rendering in real time you know and that was always what it was to me it was like if i can at least work in a real time box and render it out you know that's fine but just waiting for ram previews was like unacceptable it was like this part at the very least should work you know and that was Mm -hmm. kind of my experience of moving towards you know working in you know real time engines because they're they're not particularly new, as JT said. Like you know, yeah. UE, even UE four has been around since like 2014. Biz RT's been around for you know a decade. You know, and so um, I think now it's just the quality is you know on par, or if not, sometimes better than you can get in a rendering setup. The cost has come down significantly, and you know, and now the I think the ease of use has finally gotten to a point where it's like okay, you know, we don't need. Uh, you know, hundreds of people writing code to make this work, you know, you know, smaller teams could actually do it. And I think that's really what's propelled this forward so much more quickly. And, um, yeah, I was really happy. I read your article and I was like, yeah, that sounds very, very familiar. <laughs> so. Our studio has sort of always had a technology agnostic approach to any sort of design. We, we, we've been using Notch, you know, for years and in sort of in a hybrid way with After Effects, you know, sometimes if a piece of content is, is pre-rendered, we're still using a real-time backend. Like, there's, there's a lot of shows where you'll never know that the entire thing is built in Notch, but we couldn't play it back that way because of cost or technical or just, you know, other uh, adoption. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really, for us, a matter of what what is the design brief, what is the intention, what is the you know what is what is the best tool to make what needs to happen happen, and that's what we use. So we haven't broken up with After Effects. We we do find ourselves uh, in it less, you know, less and less. So we're just sort of flowing very very fluidly back and forth between, um, mm-hmm. yeah, the different different modalities of live and, and real time and pre rendered. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, I think that that I mean that sounds like, and it seems like a lot of people in this world are doing these sort of blended workflows or all these different things and you know in terms of choosing what factors uh, cause those things it seems a lot of times you know if you're pre-rendering something like you said Ben if it's uh, on time code because you know you can run in real time but if it's the same every night with the same environment there's no external factors changing it like it can be a pre-rendered file it's totally fine uh, but otherwise you might want something that is real time because it needs an audio input or has a camera input or you have to track it with a 3D camera with all the MR and XR workflows so yeah, it seems like there's kind of a laundry list of tools, and I think I've heard you say before, Kirsten, there is kind of a right or wrong answer depending on whether something needs to be real time or not. Um, as much as I want to pre-render something, sometimes it just might not work. And I think that's an interesting thing that we've all been finding is we're, we're discussing the 
the nice things that come out of real time in terms of not having to wait to render for a long time or more flexibility and stuff like that. But there are also some things that are now possible because of real time running that physically would not be possible before, especially when it comes to camera tracking or interaction at some point. There's only so much you can do with pre-rendered elements for some of those things. I, I do want to touch on something, though, again, going more to the core of this discussion, which is we all love real time and it's great and it's cool, but what does it do in terms of the relationship with design? I think there's a real interesting conversation about, you know, hearkening back to when Notch became really popular in the live entertainment industry. Like, let's focus on live entertainment a bit for a moment and say that, you know, is there is there a feeling that, you know, real time content is cheaper, faster, takes less people and it's just a like one button thing. Um, and how do you guys combat that in your own worlds uh, from project to project? There is a feeling, certainly. I, I have uh, <laughs> I have encountered that. Um, the I think it's a matter of managing expectations, and also you know you you hear the words real time content creation, and I, I argue that that is not a thing. Um, it is real time rendered. Uh, you can change things in in real time or very quickly, but at some point you still have to build every world, every tool, and in some cases, you know, it's really interactive or, you know, really complicated, all of the logic and, um, you know, all of the rules surrounding what you're trying to do, and that's a, that is an intense process. Uh, I don't see that it saves time or money over the course of the project, however, the, the, the power and render at the end is, is, I can take all of my cost savings or time savings there and spread that out along the, uh, the entire process. Mm. And if I don't, the results suffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's definitely this kind of thought process that kind of seemed to come about that was like, yeah, if we just do it this way, like you know, we can we can make unlimited changes like whenever we want. And um, one of my good friends, I think, had the best saying. He's like, it's not a juicer. You know, you can't just <laughs> shove things into it and juice comes out. Like it takes time and effort. <laughs> to build something and um I, that's kind of what i started saying to my clients i'm like hey it's just you know it's not a juicer man like you know it takes <laughs> it still takes a team to make it work um no matter what what the tool is um i mean i do think that for certain things as you all have kind of mentioned like it it makes way more sense to do it you know rather than have to try and rehearse something that has matched like rendered content that sounds like nightmarish now in hindsight that's how we used to do it right but you know it's, it's like <laughs> Wow, we don't have to do that anymore. But um, I think a lot of the stuff we we talked about yesterday too is like you have to get this conversation started early, though. You can't decide on site. Like, hey, you know what? Like, you know, rendering is taking too long. Let's move to a real time workflow. That that's I'll like one notch, worst please. case scenario. <laughs> you know, yeah, because you're like nothing's been by planned. We have the same personnel we had yesterday, but now you want to, you know, <laughs> you want to go back and do pre production now. You know, and so that's that's kind of I think what we were talking about with client expectations and especially just communication. It's like, like you, you really have to do this at the onset. I mean, live events has a pipe and things like movies or games, you know, and so like it may be easier to make that pivot, but still, you know, it, it's not an, an instantaneous shift. And, and especially with VFX or something like that, you really can't decide that, you know, once you're three months in, like, you know, this thing, mm-hmm. this conversation should have happened a year ago. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, that's really been coming up kind of a lot, you know, where when people see these projects, like whether it's Mandalorian or JT's Katy Perry show, like, that, oh, we want to do that. You're like, great. So, you know, um, what, why didn't we talk about that like three months ago? You know, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know, and so. It's good to have that discussion early. Yeah, it brings in like a sort of different level of expectations management. I think, but I mean, in in our practice so far, we've we've almost been sort of like shielding the client from the fact that it is being produced in a generative form. So we did um, the Liam Gallagher tour last year uh, with Michael Agat and Young designed it, and um, that was entirely produced in Notch. So there was no video content per se to it. So, like, how do you actually put a price on something like that for? You know, a, a client who thinks they're buying something uh, or paying for something. So, you know, we, we've just sort of chosen to not really make too much of a feature of it. So it's sort of, it's more like you are paying for a design process that then goes into a production process, but then this stuff is realized on stage. And, you know, the scale of that varies, you know, from like me and Adam to, you know, many other people, just depending on kind of where we're at uh, sort of thing. Because, you know, you whether it's After Effects that's taking ages to render, you've got to manage their 
you know expectation of when it's ready or if it's real time you've got to kind of manage that expectation that they're well you've got to educate them that i think you know it's like you say with the juice of things brilliant you know you have to kind of construct something in the first place mm -hmm. um it's not just it's not ma it's not magic wand you know like that doesn't exist mm. um, yeah. and they did you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think what you said too is is interesting too in terms of like, not to get into the intricate details of financing and budgeting and stuff like that, but you know, depending on who's listening, they might not be aware of all the processes that go into real time content. And I think it is interesting to discuss how, with any tool, whether it is a pre rendered option like After Effects or Cinema 4D or something like that, or a real time tool like Unreal or Not Sure. Smode or whatever you know whatever you want to talk about i think there's obviously always a world where if someone's starting in theater or they're you know uh just starting on their own company or trying to figure things out like there's always a different version of of a production and one of those versions might be you and your friend with one projector just trying to figure this out and make it work on your own you know all the way up to you know a 90 person studio working on this you know so there's always this spectrum but what i have been discussing on the real-time side of things is in regards to the question of it being cheaper, easier, faster, like you said, Finn, it's a, it's a process and there's a group of people. So even if you're by yourself or with a small group of people or it's low budget, I would still think it's worthwhile going through those phases of production with research and mood boards, storyboards, design frames, you know, right. animatics, like really discussing what you're doing and exploring the process because that kind of then segues into, our again, our root of our conversation, which is real-time design is not really a thing, it's real-time rendering. So there's still a design process. And how do we how do we value the design and protect it? Because we've all discussed this over the past couple of years, even with, with not your other tools, is that how easy is it to rabbit hole and go down this way on a path for something that is cool and shiny? And, oh, we found new particles, I'm going over here. And then you turn around and like, oh, the design brief is a totally different thing. So how do you guys manage balancing, keeping design an important aspect of this? Um, and keeping it aesthetically clean and what's intended uh, when you're working with real-time tools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, as you said, one of the worst things you can do is just open up a blank project and just start, <laughs> because you know you will you will never get anywhere. You know, when you have that kind of mindset that oh, we can do anything. You know, and yeah, I mean, even if something as simple as 3D modeling, the first thing you normally do is go find references, right? You find a reference you know, images of what you're trying to do, you find your color palette, you make sketches, you do this kind of stuff, even for the most basic of like 3D character modeling. And so I think that approach still applies to, you know, anything, because ultimately you're still building content with the same tools to start with. You're just putting it together in a different fashion. But, um, you know, it's, I think also you mentioned kind of just about the budgeting kind of thing of this too. Like it, it a lot of it depends on how you're constructing the real-time project as well. You can make a real-time project that's all keyframes, and it will be just as hard and meticulous to work with as rendered content. Like if you don't have certain things that you've hooked up to actually be able to change them, it's not really that different. Yeah, you can you know preview it better, better quality. You can render it out faster, but it will still be just as inflexible. If that was not the goal, um, you can definitely run into some some trouble there. So that's why it's really important to know what is the goal, like. Should I be able to move this object or that object, or or not? Do they not need to? You know, and, and you know, somewhat limiting sometimes the tools you give people, um, you know, as well to manipulate them. Like I, I think that's another thing we ran into initially was let's expose everything. We'll give the lighting <laughs> programmer a handle for every single parameter. That way. I'd never have to hear from him again. Um, but that, yeah. that turned out to not be the case. You know, it was more like oh, it's too, too much. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, handing off the, the decision making, which is design at the end of the day, right? It's problem solving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, there's certainly an amount of discipline that needs to be maintained. That you know, it's for a lot of us, this is kind of a new world. Um, mm -hmm. But those same disciplines, we. Um, we developed in our kind of our older workflows still apply, and um, even more so now, especially with what, what uh, she was talk about, talking about with the logic and the like. What what do we expose? What do we what do we need to figure out? Like, is it audio reactive? In which case, like, how do you do the you know the smoothing or you know what what things? So it's not just a mess. You know, these are all really important and and very fluid topics that we need to continue having that discussion with our clients and with our with our end product and you know yeah you've got your storyboards you've got your mood boards you've got your brief um it, 
you should definitely always be referring back, even even as deep as you get into the software. Uh, at the oh. end of the day, it's just a tool. It's just another tool. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think we've been finding like we've, if I think, been tightening up our kind of briefing and sort of making referencing a little bit sharper, just you know, to kind of reduce the kind of endless possibilities a little bit, so you can sort of keep things kind of honest. But it's it's quite interesting to see about the sort of parameter thing as well, because I think I very much found when you're when certainly like in theater land when we're working in america we can't touch the box like the programmer is the only person who can so there'd be a very interesting kind of like shift in you know who's actually creatively in control at that point because if we expose parameters and need keyframing someone actually has to do that and i can't do that um you know if, if you're being you could end up baking them all into the thing but at which point what's the point you might as well just render it and when you need it to be active so you know you need good programmers as well to work with you it's sort of they, they become kind of very much part of that and you know, I think there are, there are programmers in there who can take on a creative vision and they become your kind of, your real best friends in those kind of situations because they're prepared to get involved. Um, you know, and you, I, it hasn't happened to me, but you know, I've had programmers who have been very standoffish and just like, just tell me where to put it, you know, and I think in that point, it would be kind of, it would be really difficult to actually get something fluid and beautiful because you're, you're putting like colouring and everything into their hands. So if they don't have a really sharp sense of color, then, you know, your designer's eyes might be kind of going, oh my God, that's exactly the wrong shade of blue or whatever. Um, <laughs> so it's like, you do have to kind of share more in the process as well. Yeah, you need to be in your whole team. You yeah. really and, I, and I think that comes back to design, right? So let's, let's in the last little bit of this talk, I want to do focus back in on that is like, that's an interesting situation in live shows with the, the relationship between a video programmer and a real time, you know, environment or it's the same with working with lighting designers and other aspects of these teams and i think that's something that everyone's finding in the world of xr right now is it's all very very smushed in together and you really have to be working together on a whole new level but i think that design process of having those conversations and communications I actually find that once you get into that phase on the programming side you do get that pause back a little bit of like hmm, what should we do here how should we do this because you have to talk with another person whereas someone stuck in real-time design you know, rabbit holes in Unreal or not whatever. Like, oh, look, I made this whole other world, you know. How do you get that render break pause where you can step back and look at what you're actually doing and, you know, come up with better ideas and have that point of reflection, which has existed in most art forms forever, you know. Like, I don't know if, if you guys, maybe it's a little bit more Kirsten and Finn, working with your design studios, like how do you manage artists and how do you discuss with them, you know, the great benefits to these tools creatively, creatively, but also, you know, making sure we're staying on path. Oh, well, I mean, I think I'm always encouraging people to kind of like get up and walk around the block. It's like a it's sort of a really simple thing. But, you know, I mean, I think certainly we've, our studio, we've been to, all together long enough that you can see when someone's got into that rabbit hole. And, you know, I think we just have like a fairly, I mean, as is important to any kind of creative kind of process but like a, an honest um critical dialogue but like a constructive one uh, as well so it's a bit like you just need to go and walk around the bot now and i know you'll find the answer because they always will you know uh but you, you kind of have to support but also you know encourage encourage regular breaks um and like my watch guilts me up in standing every hour and you know it's like simple things like that actually are really helpful because it stops you kind of you know it can happen anyway you can like go into some kind of like pinterest tunnel when you're kind of building reference libraries or something awful like that, you know. Um, it's it's a useful thing in just sort of emphasizing that kind of, uh, you know, the welfare aspect of it as well. You just can't tie yourself to computer all day. You have to be a human being. It's, yeah, it's very easy without the enforced break of the RAM preview or the or the render or the compile, you know, from throwing it all the way back. Like there, there was that time that the computer needed to chunk through things, which read your brain to stop thinking for a little bit. And in, in real-time workflows, it's very easy to just realize you've sat there for eight hours and haven't moved, you know, except for <laughs> very <laughs> intense necessities. Um, it's, it's yeah, it, it, it all comes back to, to discipline in, in both the design and in, in you know, throws kind of to the, the panel with cultural wellness. Like, we should encourage standing up and taking a break and, you know, in, in our industry, especially the, the grind and, and, you know, how long you've worked and how long you can stay up and how long you can work is, is somewhat glorified. Um, 
in real time rendering will definitely um, encourage that sort of behavior unless you actively stop it. Um, yeah. That's definitely yeah. a conversation that you I need mean, to be having with your team and yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's really interesting because I mean, even with real time rendering, there's still like certain things you can't do right. Like what we were talking about yesterday, when you send stuff to get reviewed. Dude, you still gotta like render out a video, right? And before you like load it into a media server, you have to build it, or you know, in the case of Unreal, you build an application. So there's still things that, but I imagine that won't be long, and that'll go away too, you know. And so it's, I think it's important to start that now because, like, my my ultimate goal would be you can go straight from editor to screen, and there's nothing in between, right? You know, you would literally just hit play on the box, and it would just do it. Um, and I think that would be ideal for so many scenarios. But you know, yeah. That's even one more thing removed out of it. So if you if you kind of don't get this down now, it's it's only going to get worse <laughs> as we kind of remove more and more of these, you know, what we would call blockers. But yeah, but you know, it it definitely is really important to have you know to, goals of what is considered finished. And I think that's usually the hardest part. Like if you have ten things you need to do, a lot of times you start on the first one and try and polish it all the way, which is a really bad way to work. You should go put in a big chunk in all 10 first and then go back, right? And uh, kind of refine as you go through. Um, but that comes down to, you know, a lot of times team management and time management, which is something that used to be, as we say, forced. Like you would, you're like, okay, there's only a certain amount of time we have before we have to go hit the render button. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's it's the design process. I think there was an interesting moment, you know, a year ago, a year ago, oh my gosh, at NotchCon in London, whenever that was, you know, there were so many questions that were popping up and so many things, and you kind of realize that a lot of these discussions are just about the process of design mm -hmm. at the end of the day, because what these real-time tools have also enabled so many people, it's democratized the environment and the tools needed to create something that is at a scale that you would not normally be able to create to. Like, obviously, there's a learning curve that's really difficult, but all of a sudden, one person can create this immersive world and, you know, in 3D with physical lighting and all sorts of stuff and you're like oh my gosh I would never have been able to do that so then what happens is it brings up and rushes all these questions forward about what design is um, mm -hmm. and what the steps are and I think it just makes it much more heightened but I, th I think you know in the last little minutes we have here I think I would like to take a second and talk about the nice parts of real-time design I kind of feel like all of a sudden I've just been like oh well this is negative yeah. and this is <laughs> negative I think you know I think we've all experienced it over the past couple of years of how you know what the challenges are and how real it is to try to attack something like that on a huge scale whether it's in theater or streaming shows live shows tours all these things but i think at the end of the day we're all doing it because we like it and it provides some amazing opportunities and i think we all have hope for what it will bring in the future so i don't know if there's anything in particular in a quick summary of like what do you like about real-time design what is the reason to get into it mm -hmm. for me it's, it's watching something happen and responding to something that's unpredictable, but it being seamless. So, you know, a kind of form can shift and change when a person looks that way, and that actor or singer or whatever is free to do that in their own time. So just, it kind of, for me, it kind of enhances the liveness of what we're doing, and kind of, it makes my world of content sort of more present and more intelligent and more part of what's happening on the stage. Yeah, what, yeah. what's been said, and it enables so much that we would not be able to do with a traditional render pipeline um, just because it, it does kind of democratize that like you know depth of field render that you can't you, we couldn't afford for a certain show but now we can because we can just do it in notch in five minutes as opposed to 40 hours yeah i mean it, it's interesting you say democratize that because yeah i mean you know definitely the costs came down but i, I think like at some point we all realized like if you brute force path trace something for long enough it will be photo real, you know, that, that, that barrier has been crossed. Like the, there's no doubt if you have enough time and enough processing, I can create exact replicas of photos, but you know, is that, you know, an option for most of us? No, not really. You know, we don't have giant render farms and stuff like that, but now you can get almost as good, you know, at 60 FPS. So why, you know, why wouldn't you, obviously I'm a bit biased. Um, I think we should do real time stuff, but you know, at the same time, it, it whether or not that always makes sense is kind of up to each individual, you know, project. And um, but I, I'm definitely in favor of kind of moving this forward um, because I, I just I see the benefits in the creative process, especially of, you know, if you have a director that can see more or less exactly what they're going to get, 
that's always good. It's closer to their vision. Same thing with a producer, you know, if, if they can see yeah. more or less what it's going to be. Great. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, everyone. This is a lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited to see where everyone goes with this over the next couple of years. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your time watching and listening. And we'll be moving on to the next panel here shortly with Laura Frank, everyone's favorite, uh, for the Culture of Wellness panel. Uh, if you want to go navigate over there in your little hop-in world. And we will all be around for questions later in the day in these social groups. So thanks, everyone, and take care. Awesome.